Thanks, you. Kevin. God bless you. Awesome. Wow, what a joy to be here today. Thanks, Pastor Kevin and Tanya, for the invitation for us to be with you. And a great joy to have my wife with me today. Let me introduce Renee to you. You're going to hear from her a little later uh, this morning, but why don't you stand anyway, give folks a chance to uh, figure out who you are. <laughs> Delight to be here. The most important thing about our lives right now is that we have two grandchildren. I know we don't look old enough for that, but uh, we are, unfortunately, right? And uh, three and a half year old Harper and a year and a half old Ryder, and uh, they are just amazing. Uh, one of my f uh, favorite moments that I've shared with Harper was about a year, a little over a year ago, and she was just starting to put words together, and, and uh, they were at our house, and I was making some lunch, and so she kind of sauntered over and, and uh, got up on a stool, and she sat there looking at me right across the, the bar where I was, uh, or what do they call that? The, the island, that's a better word for me today, the island. <laughs> and uh, so I made up my grilled cheese and tomato soup, which is my go-to meal. And uh, I said, Harper, do you want something? And she, she shook her head like that. And so I made her something and pushed it over her way. And she said, thank you, Papa. And uh, isn't that great? So that's my, uh, the first words, I think, that she put together and spoke directly to me. So uh, I cherish those, so yeah. What a great worship service. Thanks, Ted, for your leadership and this team. Uh, awesome. And uh, when he slipped into that Gaither song, I thought, oh, boy, this is awesome. How many like the Gaithers? Anyone Gaither? Yeah. All right. OK. Yeah. All right. And how many like uh, Jesus Culture and yeah. Elevation Worship Band? And how many like it all in between? All right, okay, you can look up on the screen, you see the little copyright date, and he's got all the decades in there, helping all of us connect to things that were meaningful along the way in our, our journey, so uh, that's so important. Uh, God is just doing amazing things around the world, and uh, thank him for what he's doing here, and uh, your church for decades has been a key player in missions for the Assemblies of God and for the Ohio Ministry Network. And so I wanted just to thank you today for that. Uh, just one slide here that will recognize the partnership that you folks have shared uh, over the years uh, with missions. And uh, hopefully that's coming or coming soon. And I appreciate that. But I don't know if you know what God has done through your church in the last five years. Oftentimes, oh, there it is. I was looking for it back there. Oftentimes, we, uh, we lose track over time, but I wanted to thank you. In the last five years, you've invested over $500,000 in giving to AG Missions and Ministry. Isn't that awesome? And, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you on behalf of our tremendous family of missionaries. The Ohio Ministry Network has direct partnership with some 70 missionary families, and uh, they are in 37 countries of the world just doing outstanding things for God. Our statisticians in Missouri tell us that every 37 seconds, somewhere in the world, somebody is coming to faith in Jesus Christ as a result of a Sons of God missionary ministry. Isn't that incredible? So that's 2,335 a day. 2,335 people added to the kingdom every day, and that's a, that's a look back over the last 10 years of our ministry that that number is based on. So, and here's the exciting thing for me, and that is the Sons of God is just one player, one missions agency, out of many that are working around the world. And so just, put, just think about what God is doing. Would there be 10 or 20 or 30,000 people coming into the kingdom every day because of what the Church of Jesus Christ is doing around the world? Very, very possible. So thank you. In a recent uh, area meeting, we recognized Bob and Brenda Engels for their tremendous leadership contribution. And I'm going to ask them to stand. Um, Pastor told me they were here. I don't, I'm not sure if I've spotted them yet. There they are. Awesome. And uh, I know you've not been counting, and I doubt that they have either, but they have led missions at Bethel for 30 years. Praise the Lord. 
I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And I get emotional because people that have that kind of passion for the kingdom of God and that kind of patience and stamina to lead at a local church level for those years without being compensated are big people. So thanks. And you've got a wonderful committee that works with you. And uh, could I ask you to stand all of the missions committee here at Bethel, about a dozen of them, and maybe they're not all here today, but thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. You know, Jesus said that we were to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So you're doing a great job helping us reach our Judea and the ends of the earth, sending missionaries to the nations and supporting missionaries working at other parts of Ohio in unique missions fields. And I'm sure that as well in the Samarias of your life, people that are marginalized or outside of the, for whatever reason, the mainstream of society, you're touching them regularly. But today I want to talk to you, each of you, about the message that you're sending to the people that live in your Jerusalem. We sat with Pastor Kevin in his office today and talked about a lot of things, but one of the things that uh, impacted me was his heart in leading you to reach the lost people of Perrysburg and Maumee and Napoleon, Toledo, other places. Because here's the reality. You send missionaries around the world. But your community, your neighborhood, your extended family has the potential for a spirit-filled, eternity-influencing witness every day of their life and of your life. Why do we invest so much in sending missionaries around the world? Here's one reason, I think, and that is that, first of all, in the world, 40% of the people have still not have an adequate witness of Jesus. It's hard to believe, I know, but people that research it tell us that 40% are unreached. And they need to hear for the first time. But in your area, across the states, there are... There are lots of lost people, lots of unsaved people. We're, we find that some 30% of the people in Ohio don't attend church on a regular basis. But they need to hear about him, and thank God they have you. You know, I want to talk to you today about on-point messaging. Messaging is huge in our world today. We have things that have happened in our world for the last 30 years that never happened before. There are more messages being sent and received every second of the day than imaginable. In fact, the text message turns 25 in December. Now, you may not want to raise your hand, but I want to find out how many people in this room do not send text messages. Anybody? Okay, we have a few proud that don't, haven't succumbed, all right? <laughs> Turn 25. A young 22-year-old British communications engineer developed the technology and sent the first text message. Today, six billion text messages are sent every day. 50 million tweets every day. A number of them by our president, of course. <laughs> there are 600,000 users of Instagram and almost 2 billion people on Facebook and 1.2 billion users of WhatsApp and 900 million of WeChat and 600 million users of O's Q Zone. How many have never heard of some of those? I didn't either until I went online and found out about them. But the reality is there's lots of messages being sent. But I submit to you today that the most powerful message, the most eternity impacting message is the life message and the spoken word of the followers of Jesus Christ. 
Churches and Christians send a lot of messages, and some of them are just not quite said the way they ought to be. I saw these messages that turned up on church signs. Look at this first one with me. Don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. (laughs) Or how about this one? Thursday night, potluck supper, prayer and medication follow. Or this, pray for the many who are sick of our church and community. Watch your prepositions there. They matter. And here's one. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery. (laughs) Punctuation is important, isn't it? On point messaging. You know, if we want to be taken seriously as followers of Jesus, we must be serious about how we are being taken. Faith is very important, but so is the fruit of our lives. Righteousness matters, but so do healthy relationships. Truth counts, but so does trust. Convictions are essential, and so is kindness. Clarity is critical, but so is charity. You see, there must be an authentic expression of Christ and the fruit of the Holy Spirit emanating from our lives on a continual basis every day that we live. Now, I found this on your website. This says this about you, that Bethel is a church family committed to helping others find the answers to life's difficult questions. It's our mission and our goal to equip you to become a committed follower of Jesus Christ and to reach your world with his saving power. That's the collective message of this body of believers. That's what you want to say to people that check out your website and walk into this building, that we're a family that you can be part of, that we want to help you find the answers to life's most important questions, and that we want to equip you then to be a committed follower of Jesus. That's your corporate message. That's your church message. That's your vision message. But I would venture to say that when you get out of this building and you go into the places where you work and you walk down the neighborhoods of your street, that most people don't know your church's mission statement. In fact, I'd venture to say that it takes people a while of attending a service here before they find out about it, unless they go to your website. The reality is that you are the most important receptacle and communicator of the message that most people will ever see. So here's the truth. God is residing within us. God is then revealed in us, and God is then reflected by us. Our attitude, our actions, our demeanor, our words, our presence, our smile, or lack thereof, our engagement, our willingness to get to know people we don't know, our desire to know more about other people than we want them to know about us. All our ways in which we demonstrate an authenticity, though we manage ourselves through trials and difficulties, through sickness and disease, through adversity and storms, says a lot about what's inside. Got a good friend named Don. He and I have been great friends since I showed up at Parma Bethel Temple, Assembly of God, to be the youth pastor back in the 80s. And he was an older gentleman and just gone through the breakup of a marriage. And so he and I started playing golf and then uh, just hung out together a lot. He became kind of a mentor to me in a lot of ways, a great friend. And several years ago, he went through a tough time. He lost his job and then he lost his home. And then in that same year, he lost a son at the age 41 to cancer. His daughter went into treatment for cancer. His twin brother was diagnosed with cancer and subsequently died. He became bound to a wheelchair. And I said to him one day in a conversation, Don, how are you doing? And here's what Don said. Don said, I'm good because God is good. What a message. What a statement. Because if God is God, 
then he is God 24-7. He is God in every moment, in every circumstance of our lives. Today's text is drawn from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through chapter 3, verse 6. I want to share this reading. If you have a Bible or a media device that you can track along with, I'd encourage you to do that. Paul writes here, but thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life, and who is equal to such a task. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Paul directs us to two metaphors in thinking about the message that we as believers are sending. The first is that we are like an aroma. We are a scent, a smell that people can be aware of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. We're not going to talk much about it today, but aromas are distinctive. Aromas are memorable. Aromas are uh, uh, usually attracting. I walked out of the house the other morning, and there was a, a major smell of skunk in our driveway, and uh, that wasn't very attractive. I, I looked around real quick to make sure <laughs> there wasn't a little critter anywhere and jumped in the car. But for the most part, aromas are attracting, and they're definitely distinctive. But Paul says here that we are in a triumphal procession. He's drawing on the imagery of what they would have seen when a Roman general who had conquered a threatening army came walking back into the city through the great Arch de Triumph in Rome. And he would be celebrated, he would be acknowledged and because he had vanquished an enemy that was threatening. And Paul writes and says that we who are in triumphal procession with Christ, the one who has vanquished every foe and eventually will put all under his, enemies under his feet, are in this triumphal procession. And from the procession, there is lifting, wafting an aroma that helps everybody to know that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the glorious one. And the second metaphor he touches on is the one I want to explore with you today, and that, and that is that we are like a letter that is written that everyone can read. He's doing this in the context of having to defend his apostleship, which if you really think about it, is pretty absurd. The Apostle Paul, who was arguably the greatest church planter, the greatest missionary, the greatest apostle that the world had ever seen, was being criticized. He, his ministry was being minimized. People were saying, well, he's not all that impressive. In fact, in the early part of Corinthians, we find out that they were saying, well, he may be your, your spiritual leader, but I prefer Peter or Apollos. Or some said, well, I just want the real thing as my pastor. I want Jesus himself. But Paul was having to defend who he was and what he was about. And in fact, much of this letter 
speaks to that. But he says to the Corinthians, he says, I don't really need a letter of recommendation to you or from you. He's not doing that in a proud and haughty way. He's simply saying, if there's any fruit of my life, any fruit of my ministry, any evidence that I planted the church among you and God has done something in Corinth, it's going to be read, it's going to be demonstrated, it's going to be seen, it's going to be smelled by your life. Pretty powerful, isn't it? So the reality is, for those of you that have been around here since Pastor Dan planted this church back in the 80s, I think it was, or maybe the late 70s. If there's any evidence of Pastor Dan's ministry now that he's gone on to his reward, it's in your life, those of you that were here then. Any evidence of the Cheshire's ministry, it's in your life. Any evidence of the Ray's ministry, it's in your life. And eventually, any evidence of the, the ministry of Kevin and Tanya, it will be because God has shaped something, has formed something in you as a result of their leadership under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, declaring the Word of God to you, living the Word of God among you, and calling you to a place of faithfulness and obedience in Christ that otherwise you might not have been. That's the proof, Paul says. That's the evidence. So he says, rather than me send a letter of recommendation to you, to you to feel good about me making another visit, he says, why don't you look around you? Why don't you look at those whose lives were transformed, who used to serve idols, who used to be involved in sin? Look at their lives and let their lives tell my story. And what, what, what I want to submit to you today is that the people in your world, the people that you rub shoulders with every day, the people that you work with, the people where you do business, where you buy gas and buy your groceries, the people in your extended family, friends, they don't need your pastor to come to them. They need you to go to them in the power of the Holy Spirit, demonstrating the character of Christ and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's what they need. You need to be that letter that they can read so that they can know who Jesus is. Pretty simple, isn't it? It's what we're all about. That's the Jerusalem that he's given us. And he says that we can only do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember what he said to the disciples before they left town? He said, make sure that you're filled with the Holy Spirit before you leave Jerusalem. Because you can't do what I need you to do and what you want to do if the Holy Spirit doesn't help you. Look at how the message paraphrases chapter 3, verse 2. Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read just by looking at you. Your very lives can be read. So what's the message? Is it on point? Is it being effective? A number of years ago when we were pastoring in Columbus, uh, we had a university ministry at Ohio State, Chi Alpha. And one of the young ladies that uh, rose to leadership in that had come to Columbus to pursue a graduate degree. And after getting there, she uh, got an apartment and had a couple extra rooms. So she, she sought a couple of others to rent uh, that apartment with her. And one of them happened to be an Indian gal named Samitha. Uh, Samitha was from... Uh, South India, she was of the Brahmin caste. She had never been exposed to Christianity. And she first met Jill, she, uh, they became pretty good friends and she visited the church and visited the campus ministry a number of times and she began to see the, the letter that could be read in Jill's life, that Jill had peace and joy and that Jill was committed to being the best student she could be, that Jill was committed to helping others grow in their faith and, and that Jill had standards when it came to the things that she would do and say and things that she would not do and not say. And over a period of time, the conviction of the letter that she was reading began to affect Samitha. She wanted to do some things outside of a lifestyle that was a good fit for that apartment and so Jill had to have a hard conversation with her she said you know what I love you but I really can't have you doing those kinds of things you're doing and coming home late at night or early in the morning and talking about those things that you've been involved with and Samitha hadn't yet accepted Christ and Jill knew that and so she wasn't being hard she was just saying it just in the con in this context it can't work and so Samitha took it pretty well and she decided to move out and got another apartment and a number of weeks went by and then months and 
finally, she got back in contact with Jill, and they had a lunch together, and Jill shared with her again that she loved her, that Jesus loved her. I remember walking into our office there on Fishing Road in Columbus one Saturday, Saturday morning early, and, and uh, we had one of those old-fashioned message machines, you know, remember those? And uh, I punched the button, and the message that came on was from Samitha. And she said, hello, this is Samitha. I want to become a Christian. Could somebody help me? And our campus pastor, Joe, went that day and met with she and Jill. And that day, Samitha gave her life to Jesus because somebody was living a letter that could be known and read by everyone. So here's my suggestion today, that the Christian's life message should convey dynamic transformation, not static obligation. The people in your world do not need to see and hear from another religious person who is no different than they were five years ago or 10 years ago or even a year ago, and who is going through their, the motions because they have to. But the people of your world will be transformed and impacted by a Christian whose life message says, I'm being changed. I'm different today than I was a year ago. Up-to-date communication. You see, there's nothing wrong with your good old days, except that they're old. And what's God doing in your life today? What's he done in your life in the last year or two? If you can share some of that through your life and through your life message, you'll find that it will be compelling. Three suggestions that, draw, that I draw from this passage today about your message. The first is that your message should say that you've had a hope takeover, that your life has been taken over, apprehended, commandeered by the hope that can only be found in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says here. That you show you're a letter from Christ. I love the way Paul puts it in Colossians chapter 1. He says there, God has chosen to make known the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I love the way the message conveys the word hope or uses it in context in Hebrews 12. It says there that faith is the music of the future and hope is being willing to dance to it. Faith, the music of the future. The music of your life a year from now, a month from now, five years from now. In eternity with Jesus forever. It's the music of the future that enables us to stand to our feet, embrace it with joy, and dance along with our Heavenly Lord. That's hope. You see, hope finds its way into the crevices in the corner of our lives. Hope is brightest when hope seems lost. Hope shines when darkness arrives. When our circumstances become difficult and our situations become dire and sickness visits us, it's hope that says that I can have joy and pleasure because Jesus is with me. It's hope that screams aloud when we lose a job or we lose a friend or we lose a loved one. And in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our mourning, in the midst of our challenges, we are looking heavenward and our gaze is fixed on the potential of our future because God is there. Faith, the music of the future and hope being willing to dance to it. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 and says... I've had it all. I've experienced it all. There have been times in my life when I've had much and times when I've had little. There's been times when I've been well fed. There's been other times that I've been hungry. 
But he says, I've learned the secret of being content in each and every situation. And then he says the secret, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, you can do everything through Christ, even manage contentment and satisfaction and a smile and joy and faith and hope when the rain clouds are threatening. Because he can do all things in you and through you. A number of years ago, a lady was at a stroke and was confined to a nursing home. Her pastor visited her a few times early on, and then it had been a number of weeks before he was able to visit again. I know this story because this pastor was my brother. And so my brother John visited her about three or four months later after not seeing her for a couple of months, and he walked into her room, and he said to her, he said to her, Mabel, he said, you're getting around so well. You're doing so well. And she said, oh, pastor, she said, you know the ten-finger prayer? I pray it at least three times a day. And my brother thought to himself and said, okay, if I should know this, I better, I better think of it real quick since I'm the pastor, right? And he thought, he said, well, you know what? I don't think I know the ten-finger prayer. She said, oh, pastor, you know the ten-finger prayer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How about that, huh? See, hope says that I'm in Christ and his glory is happening within me on a daily basis. In fact, Paul says at the end of chapter 3 here, he says, the, the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or liberty. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. He says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, there is liberty. For what? To do what? To be changed. For my life and my life situation to be different tomorrow than it was yesterday. And for the transforming work of God, the revelation of the truth of, truth of God, and the presentation of the reality of Jesus to be in and through me different tomorrow than it was today. That's what he has given me by the Spirit, the freedom to be. That's what Paul is saying in this passage. So Christ is in us, and that gives us hope. And our message should say, I've been taken over by hope. I am a prisoner to hope. I've been apprehended by hope. And as a result, the people that see you every day and hear from you every day know that Jesus is residing in you. Listen to how Paul encourages the Roman Christians when he writes on the theme of hope. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. The pathway that leads to hope, Paul says, is a pathway that takes us at times through suffering and, and then perseverance and character. And eventually character reveals itself in hope. Does your life message say you've had a hope takeover? The second thing I want to suggest is that your life message should say that you've had a heart makeover. A heart makeover. That's the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is it transforms from within. It's a seed that gets planted that produces fruit from the inside out. You can't change on your own, but the Spirit of God can change you. He can reframe you. He can mold you. He can make you. Paul says here in verse 3 that the letter is written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, like the commandments were written, but on tablets of human hearts. Because your heart, friend, is now a holy habitation, is the residence of God by the Spirit of Jesus. 
You're new from the inside out. Your desires and motivations change. Your thoughts and expectations change. Your purpose and your perspectives, they all change. You see, this makeover, this heart makeover will consume everything that you are and everything that you possibly be. And this heart maker come, makeover comes, by the way, with the currency of surrender, sacrifice, and the giving up of our will. You've already opted in. So I'm just reminding you today that what God's doing in you, the maker of your heart, the transformation of your life, what Paul referred to when he says, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And the moment you receive Jesus, the slate is clean and you are put on a path to God's divine purposes and perspective, to a, a place of purity and, and power in him. Now, it takes us a while to get there. It's a journey. We all understand that. But the people around you that see you will know that your heart has been changed. You show that you're a letter from Christ written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God on tablets of human hearts. So what's a made-over heart like? Well, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 4, that we should have compassionate hearts. Chapter 4, verse 1, that we should have serving hearts. Chapter 4, verse 16, that we should have strong hearts. Chapter 8, verse 16, that we should have caring hearts. Chapter 9, verse 7, that we should have generous hearts. There's a few things to get started with today. I loved uh, the statement in your bulletin this morning. Did you notice that? A quote from Max Lucado. I choose gentleness. Nothing is won by force. I choose to be gentle. If I raise my voice, may it be only in praise. If I clench my fist, may it be only in power, prayer. If I make a demand, may it be only of myself. A heart that's made over, that our lives are changed and rearranged by Jesus. Here's the point. Character counts, and bad character discounts. Your character matters. Bad character sends confusing signals to people that are smelling the aroma of your life and reading the letter that's being written. A number of years ago, we had a family in our church that uh, lost a baby at birth. Kevin and Kristen had gotten pregnant and wasn't long before they found out from the doctor that the child was not viable outside the womb in its present condition. A, a skull was not forming, though a brain was. Of course, they were advised by all the medical personnel that studied their situation that uh, Kristen should have an abortion. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to pray that God will do a miracle and develop a skull around that brain. How many believe that God could develop a skull in a uterus? Now, we don't know why God didn't do it, but he didn't. And so that baby was born and was only lived a few minutes and then passed into eternity. But all throughout that journey, Kristen and Kevin were being watched by their friends. Because Jesus was their hope and still was their hope. That Jesus had given them strong hearts and even in the midst of one of presumably and arguably one's most difficult challenges, they were staying strong in him. They still continued to serve at church. They still continued to lead a prayer ministry. They still continued to go on outreach. Kevin's boss at the bank, the vice, one of the vice presidents of the bank, said, Kevin, if you just don't want to show up someday, you, just, you don't have to come. Just call and let us know you're not coming in. Time off with pay any time he wanted it, basically. But he showed up every day. People became very familiar with their story. The day we had the service at the church, a lot of people were there. But on that day, the message was, that was being sent was about two people who, in the midst of incredible adversity, 
had stayed strong in their faith, had allowed God to strengthen their hearts. And all around that room, many of them, many people there that didn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The resounding, echoing themes after that service were, I can't believe the way those two have handled this. Now, let me tell you something. You know it. It's pretty obvious. But you don't go through a challenge like that with joy, with faith, in hope, unless your heart has been made strong by Jesus. You don't. And I had a conversation with Kevin's boss in the lobby after the service. We had known her because she had helped our, our bank, our, I should say our church, get, get a loan for the building. And she was standing just looking at a, at a photograph that was on the wall, a picture. And most, a lot of people had left, and I walked over to her and I said, Lynn, I said, what are you thinking? What's going on in your, in your heart, your mind? She said, I, I realized today that I don't have the kind of faith in God. I don't have the kind of relationship with God that Kevin and Kristen have. She said, I've been in church all my life. I've gone to a church. But she said, had something like this happened to me, I'd, I'd have pretty much had to check out of life for a while. And I said, you know how? You know how they did this, don't you? She said, absolutely. Her life was powerfully impacted by the life message of a man and a woman who allowed Jesus to strengthen their hearts and they communicated probably more powerfully than any other words could have said. Just to encourage you today to allow Jesus to do something so strong and powerful in your heart that when the winds blow and the rains come and the thunder clouds boom in your life, that the people around you say, wow, I need some of what they've got. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can be content in each and every situation of life. You can if you allow him to help you. And the third suggestion I make from this passage is that your message should say that you've had a humility do-over. Look at verse 5 with me. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Now, Paul is a man, as I mentioned before, who had an apostolic gifting and ability and outcomes of ministry that would have put any others to shame had he wanted to play that card. But he says here that I'm really nothing in myself. Anything I am and everything I do, it's because of Jesus in my life. My competence comes from God. And I fear that oftentimes as Christians, whether or not we intend for this message to be sent, we send the message that it's too much about us and not quite enough about Jesus. You see, humility is an interesting word. In fact, in the Greek language, and I think you know that the New Testament was written in Greek, in the Greek language, there was not even a word for humility that was cast in a positive light until the time of Jesus. Up to then, the only time the Greek word that was translated humility was used was in a way that was demeaning or like a servant kind of approach. Someone that was forced to take a posture of humility because they didn't have a choice. It was not a, certainly not a trait to be valued. But Jesus reframed and reshaped 
the meaning of that word. Through his life and his message, through the way that he served, he came saying, I have come to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man has come to serve. In fact, he says in Matthew, if you're weary and broken, heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. And he says there that you'll find that I am humble and gentle in heart. Think of the way that Jesus interacted with people that needed his love. Think of the lady that he met at the well in Sychar in John chapter 2. A lady that had a desperate need for living water. He simply asks her a few questions, speaks prophetically about something that he would have had no way of knowing of in her life that she had had, had multiple marriages. Didn't confront her about the different place that the Samaritans worship from the Jews, Mount Gerizim. He, he just simply, humbly, as the Son of God, the Messiah, engaged a lady in conversation, and it was so compelling that she believed that he was Messiah and went back and told her whole village, and they all accepted him. Or think of the way that he interacted with the lady in John chapter 8 when she was brought to the temple courts, surrounded by dozens, maybe hundreds of people, and caught in the very act of adultery. And when she is condemned by those religious leaders that brought him to ask him a question to try to trap him, remember what he did? The first thing he did, he pretty much ignored them. He wrote down, he, he kneeled down and began to write with his finger in the, in the ground. We don't know what he wrote, but we do know that it was something that was so convicting to those religious leader hypocrites that they turned and walked away. And when he finally got up, he simply looked at a lady and said, where are your accusers? And then he said, and neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Humble. If anybody had the option of playing the God card, it was Jesus, right? But he didn't. In fact, Paul writes about him in Philippians 2 and says that he humbled himself unto death, even the death on a cross. And just before that, in Philippians chapter 2, he says to us, put others' interests before your own, and don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. What's he saying to us? He's saying that if you want God to exalt your life, your ministry, your witness, which is the end of that Philippians passage, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord, the glory of God the Father. If we want God to exalt our testimony, our witness, and cause it to be lasting, eternal, and impacting, and life-changing, the way to do it is through humility. A humility that asks questions, a humility that seeks to gain understanding and information before giving it. I was driving one Sunday morning and heard the song come on the radio, Empty me of me so I can be filled with you. Empty me of the selfishness inside, every vain ambition and the poison of pride. Empty me of me. And I fear too often that as Christians we become known for being judgmental and condemning rather than being welcoming, kind, and gracious. Don't think of yourself. Jim, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But as Paul says in Romans with sober judgment, I am what I am by the grace of God. And humility that conveys that will be powerful. I'm going to ask Renee to come and share for a few moments about an experience that she's had with some ladies. She is mentoring, discipling about a dozen young women in a small group that's part of her church back in Columbus. And God has given her an opportunity to, to build relationships and share Jesus in so many powerful ways. And so I'm going to ask her to do that now.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So in your conversations with God that you've had for years, do you realize he remembers all of them? And there were years ago that I had just been talking to God and said, I want to lead a Jewish person to the Lord. So I didn't just say I want to witness to them because I've had many Jewish people in my life, but I said I want to lead somebody who's Jewish, somebody who is that you, one of your people. Lord, I want the opportunity to lead them to the Lord. So as time goes on, I um, was acquainted with one of my daughter-in-law's uh, friends, and I was under the understanding, understanding that when they were in college, she had gone to a campus crusade meeting and she had given her life to the Lord, and I didn't know she was Jewish. And, uh, and so as we got to know the kids, and then our son and daughter-in-law, which is illegal, they moved to Florida, and then uh, Katie would call me every once in a while and say, are you going to be at church? I want to, you know, come, can I sit by you? And I said, sure. So I thought she was a Christian. And uh, after church, I would always just share, we'd share little nuggets about what the sermon was about and applying it. And one day, you know, she said, can I talk to you? And it was probably three or four months later. And she said, um, I am okay with God, but I am not okay with Jesus. I am Jewish. And I said, you are? And I said, how come I didn't know that? And, and I said, well, you know that prayer you prayed is kind of null and void because it's all because of his son, Jesus. And she said, I don't believe it. I just don't believe in him. I've been brought up not to believe with him, and I don't. And she said, you know, but I still want to come to church. So, so I, she, she became a part of my small group and gotten to know some of the girls in my group. But I committed to be on a journey with her. And... You know, she was just a strong business girl now and, and going on in her career. And it, it will cost us. So she would come to our group, and I would meet with her at Starbucks, and then I'd meet with her at her apartment. And then I also had a girl who grew up Muslim. So then I'd meet with both of them, and I'd, you know, ask God to just, I would just pray and pray about how to share with them and what to share with them and be on time, be in a timely manner, you know, with both of these girls. And... Um, and it was just so cool, like on our conversations, and I had gotten her books, and she did a lot of traveling, and I'd, you know, say, you know, Katie, God is going to encounter you himself. You know, here, you're his daughter. You know, he loves you. And she'd just say, okay. And, you know, and so I'd call her when she's in New York, and I'd say, did you see him yet? Have you encountered him yet? You know, he's right around the corner. And she'd say, nope, I still don't believe in him. <laughs> you know, and I would try, to, I would do all these studies, and do Old Testament prophecy and New Testament fulfillment and just trying to bring these two worlds together for, together for her because it was so my heart that she sees the love of my life, you know, and she just continued to journey with me and, and the girls and she just say, no, you know, I want to, but I don't, you know, I just don't. And so it was about 1030 one night I was in, we were in uh, the girl who had been Muslim in her apartment. And so the three of us are there and it's like 1030 at night and we just have our Bibles out and we are just studying. And like in a moment, you know, she is one way, like right here. And then in a moment, she just like burst into tears and she said, I see him. I see him. She said, I see Jesus. And we were just sitting there and she just is crying. She said, how come I couldn't see him? You know, and it was just the timing of the Holy Spirit. It's the timing. And so she starts calling friends. Like she calls my daughter-in-law in Florida, and, and by this time it's after 11, and she calls somebody else. And then, you know, we were talking, and then, we, and then I said, so Katie, are you ready to ask him to be your master? And, and then I wanted to lead her in prayer. And she goes, wait, wait, wait. She said, I have something. I have something in my phone. And here she had read somewhere like a prayer of salvation, and she typed it in her phone for the day that she could say it. And I'm just, you know, when, you, when God puts people in your life or you just whisper a prayer to him, like he remembers everything. And he honors us with the desires of our heart. And there is somebody who desperately needs you to journey with them. Do some extra studying. Meet them at Starbucks. Meet them wherever they can meet. And just put time into their life because it's God's timing. And right after she, she accepted the Lord, two months later, she took an assignment with her job to London. So she was kind of out of my life, out of, you know, my area for a while. But she has just grown with God, you know, ever since. So it's just a privilege. privilege. Awesome. <laughs> Amen. Wow. So did you catch some key words there? Journey, patience, 
the Holy Spirit's time, and it's putting yourself humbly in a place with people that acknowledges God's sovereign plan and gives you an opportunity to be there when that moment, that aha, mo aha moment arrives. Could I share with you a final little story to hopefully motivate you as we finish today? Uh, I'm gonna, I won't do the other couple slides. I was in uh, Jamaica a number of years ago speaking and uh, during the mornings I would walk and I was walking along the beach one particular day and I came across a fisherman, I think maybe the only real fisherman I've ever met in my life. Okay, this guy made his living. He existed because he fished. And uh, he had a, a, a boat that was a hollowed out tree trunk about 12 feet long. He had a couple of nets and as I came up upon him, he had a little fire and he had a, a can, like a, a big vegetable can you'd get at Costco with the top and bottom cut out. He had a little fire in that and he was, he was grilling a little fish. I felt bad for that little fish on that fire. And so uh, we started talking and, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to eat, eat, eat some of his fish and I, I kind of declined as he kind of picked it up and started munching along and uh, eating it. And so I asked him about his life and fishing and it's all he had ever done. His hands were grizzled and hard and, and uh, callous from the salt water and and uh, his daily exposure to it, so forth. And uh, I got there thinking as I stood looking out over the ocean, thinking about what it would be like to get up at two and three in the morning and go out on, in that little unsafe boat and cast a net and hope that it got full and then what do you do if it does and get that thing roll and the waves. And I thought, you know, this is, I, I don't think I'd like that. And so I said to him, Jocelyn, I said, do you ever wake up early in the morning and just decide not to go out and fish? Maybe the storms, the waves, you're tired. And he said, no, I fish every day. And I said, really? I said, why is that? He said, every day is a fishing day, though every day is not a catching day. And what I'm suggesting to you today is that the consistency, the constancy, the fluidity, the flexibility, the way that your life letter is read day after day after day after day will be the message that will be an aroma, will be a message that can be read and people will know that Jesus is alive in your life. So I ask you three questions as I finish this morning. First of all, how's your hope doing? Remember, it's hope that steadies us in the storms. It's hope that gives us joy when otherwise we would be overcome with sorrow and sadness. It's hope that keeps us full of faith and keeps us dancing to the promises of God. That's hope. The second question is this, how about your heart? We didn't have time to talk about all of them today, but is your heart strong? Is it generous? Is it caring? Is it faithful? Are those attributes of your character that can contribute to your words, your spoken message, or is there something about that, your heart, your character, that discounts from your witness? And then humility. How do people in your life, the non-Christians that know you, what do they think about your projection, your presentation of yourself compared to other people? Do they see you as someone with your nose up, being critical? Or do they see you as someone who identifies with them in their weakness, who hasn't forgotten their past and who is willing to take the journey, willing to invest time, willing to care, willing to hear, be in conversations where they maybe don't agree with everything because there's a humility that says you're valuable. And even though you don't know Jesus yet, I love you and I care about you. Do they know you as they knew Jesus as humble 
as gentle in heart? Those three questions, how's your hope, how's your heart, how's humility?